This is entitled Spirit of Prophecy Schoolroom. We've been discussing the schoolroom that God designed for, quote, all after time, end quote. It had a, quote, model school established in Eden, the home of our first parents. The Garden of Eden was a schoolroom. Nature was a lesson book. The creator himself was the instructor. And the parents of the human family were the students, end quote. This is all found in the first paragraph of the section entitled The Eden School on page 20 of the book Education by Ellen White. To get a look at what this schoolroom was like at the end of time, we need to look at the two schools Ellen White established, one in Australia, Avondale, and one in America, Madison, in a description of what should be taught to the teachers that are to emerge from these two schools, we will look at the original curriculum that God gave as, quote, a model for man throughout all after time, end quote. From the Advocate of Christian Education, December 1903, we have articles put together by Edward A. Sutherland, the editor. E.A. Sutherland was the co-leader of Madison School here in the United States. Under his guidance, the principles of true education that he learned from the letters and testimonies coming from Ellen White were advocated. Quote, Sutherland had also studied the historical development of education and its impact on the moral and political direction of societies through the ages. He saw clearly a drastic difference in the papal forms and methods of education and the Protestant education instituted by the reformers of the 16th century. He traced the influence of efforts for educational reform in the United States in the early 1800s and saw the great need for a return to the Protestant principles in the general direction of education, methods, and curriculum of the time, end quote. This is from the introduction to the reprint made by Madison Educational and Research Institute. In this 1903 publication, number 12, is an article by M. Bessie de Graw. She was one of the leaders at Madison. Listen carefully to the curriculum and see if it is anywhere near what we have today in Adventist schools. This article is entitled, Methods of History Teaching for Elementary Students. And uh, she begins, uh, let me find it. In offering suggestions for sixth grade classes, I take it for granted that for five years the pupils have been studying the lives of men who were prominent in the history of God's work. Now, when you think of sixth grade, you may think of primary school and a lot more schooling to go on, but that's not the way it was. I compare it to the Amish of today who only go to eighth grade. So we're nearing graduation here when we're discussing things. And to consider the Amish and that type of education uh, I look at John Kemp, an Amish man who started uh, advanced ecological agriculture. He completed his formal education at 14 years of age and then went to work in his father's field. And within 15 years, he has the most advanced ecological uh, agriculture company and uh, teaching going on in the United States and uh, possibly the world, but I don't know about the other languages. They may be advanced uh, also like this. And um, he has a podcast in which he interviews professors and others who have found understanding in agriculture, this all from an eighth grade education. Uh, and she tells us they have grown at before the sixth grade, they have grown familiar with the leading characters in Old Testament history. That's like patriarchs and prophets and prophets and kings. They know the prominent figures in the history of the Christian church. That's like Acts of the Apostles. And they've been introduced to many men to whom God has entrusted truth in modern times. 
such men as Wycliffe, Huss, Jerome, Luther, and Melanchthon, Roger Williams, William Miller, Horace Mann, Livingston, Moffat, Carey, and others, as the teacher may have found time. This accumulation of knowledge, this biographical study, forms the great background for future history study. With the sixth year, a change should be made. Biographical study should not be discarded, but it should take a secondary place, and the pupil should receive his introduction to nation and peoples as such. We're going to see where this introduction to nations and peoples as such leads us. He knows Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as men of God. Now let him meet the Hebrew nation, and having met this nation, teach him the laws of the nation's life, its growth and its decay, just as you teach him the laws of his own body in the physiology class. Israel's history is recorded in such detail because in that history may be found an exemplification of every condition which the nations of this world have to meet. A glance at certain facts will illustrate this and will suggest what the teacher should have in her mind when she begins her classwork with the sixth year pupils. Number one, God recognizes the equal rights of all men. Acts 17, 25 through 26. Number two, and number two is quite extensive and that's all there is, is, is one and two. In order that all men might live in accordance with this principle of equality, A, he established his nation in the country. And she quotes Genesis 12, 1 through 6. The place where they first tarried was Shechem, under the shade of the oaks of Merah, in a wide grassy valley with its olive groves and gushing springs between Mount Ebal on the one side and Mount Gerizim on the other. Abraham made his encampment. It was a fair and good, goodly country, a land of brooks and water and fountains and depths that spring out of valleys and hills, a land of wheat and barley and vines and fig trees and pomegranates, a land of oil, olives, and honey. It was in the free air of these upland plains with their olive groves and vineyards, their fields of waving grain, and the wide pasture grounds of the encircling hills that God laid the foundation for the greatest nation which has ever existed on earth. Notice that that's a foundation, a nation established in the country. B, he intended that each family should own a small piece of land and that the whole earth should eventually be divided proportionately among the descendants of Adam. And you can read about that piece of land from Ministry of Healing 183 and 184, and about it being divided proportionately among the descendants of Adam till it filled the whole earth. You can read about that in Education, page 22. C. He gave the law of Jubilee that the people might never be able to get away from this idea of owning and cultivating land. Although the heathen might build cities and congregate in congested centers, yet his people, so long as they adhered to this one principle, could never make their homes in the cities. They should go into the cities to preach the gospel, but not to live. They were compelled to scatter and to maintain their health, their freedom, and their independence by living in the country and cultivating the soil. So where do we get our independence, our freedom, and our health? In the country and cultivating the soil. And for the law of Jubilee, read Leviticus 25, 8 through 17. D, that this might continue beyond the generation to which the law was given, God led his people to establish industrial schools, and we'll see what these industrial schools were, in which the students were taught the laws of proper education, excuse me, proper cultivation, the art of fertilizing the soil and preventing pests by the rotation of crops, that the land should rest every seventh year, that fruit trees uh, should not bear their fruit when too young, that different kinds of seed should not be planted on the same soil, the proper methods of harvesting and threshing various grains, the proper care of domestic animals, the relation which the care of the poor sustains to the proper 
cultivation of the land and other similar truths. These were all gathered out of the Bible. Just in equal measures were one of their studies. Every child was taught some trade. It was a disgrace to be dependent. Everyone was supposed to be self-supporting, and every child should be able to support his parents. In those schools, the science of government was taught. The heads of families were the students. Benevolence, generosity, courtesy, wisdom and diplomacy, perseverance, and skill in work and the ability to govern oneself, these were the principal lessons in civil government. So practical were they that the students, although known to be advocates of a new religion, commanded the respect and friendship of surrounding peoples. The spiritual education in these schools was of the highest order, and so interwoven was it with the manual and physical training that the separation was practically impossible. Fathers so taught repeated these lessons both by precept and by example to their children. Psalm 78, 3 through 8. It was thus that these industrial schools became great national centers whose influence was felt by the people of many other nations. They were the great evangelizing agency in the Jewish nation. Notice how they evangelize via these schools. And when you think of those schools, think of schools of the prophets. The results of such a system was striking. So long as the nation adhered to these laws, all of these laws of cultivation uh, are laws of the Bible. And this term includes all laws, mental, physical, and spiritual, to which reference has already been made. The following results were seen. One, the people as a whole had a strong spiritual experience so that surrounding nations were brought to a knowledge of God. Witness the experience of Abraham as an illustration of this fact. Mm -hmm. Two, the government viewed from the standpoint of other governments held a most prominent position in the world. The Jewish people were known as a wise and understanding people. It was adherence to these laws that brought the kingdom under Solomon to the place where it was recognized as the leading government of the world. The fact that Israel gave to the world a type of architecture which was copied even by the artistic Greek is an illustration of the power exerted by the nation when at its height. Three, the people were physically strong. Correct principles of living developed a powerful physique, which is still recognized in that nation. Four, it made the nation the leader in commercial matters. The Jews loaned to all the rest of the world, for it was a promise of God that if they would obey him, and this meant that if they would properly cultivate the soil, if they would care for the poor, if they would recognize the equal rights of all men, if they would remember the Sabbath, to keep it as a memorial of the God who had given the law, their land should yield a hundredfold, and they should loan and not borrow. Five, they had the promise that as a nation they might exist forever. What more could be asked? The promise originally made to Adam was renewed to this people, and it may be added to this promise will be fulfilled to the generation that recognizes these same laws of national growth and proves true to them. Six, whenever through envy of surrounding nations, Israel as a nation descended from the exalted plain to which obedience brought it, the decline was invariably marked by the following conditions. So here we see the fall of any people who move away from how God has designed a nation should be set up. A, the people left the country and congregated in cities. B, they erected costly dwellings similar to those of their heathen neighbors. C, they adopted heathen methods of teaching their children, and naturally these children, D, thought as the heathen thought and worshipped the gods of the heathen. The educational and religious apostasy was thus complete. It was followed promptly by a decline in government. E, they intermarried with the heathen. F, society immediately divided itself into two classes, the rich and the poor, and the rich oppressed the poor. You can read about that in Education, page 44. 
slavery was the invariable, inevitable result. H. Such a condition could exist only in a monarchical form of government. This completed what is familiar to us today as the papal system or a union of church and state. I. The fall of the nation was imminent, and from their position as slaveholders, its people came to occupy a position of most abject slavery. Then there would ascend to heaven a cry for deliverance, and God would begin the work of restoration. So let's just take a look at what this restoration is going to comprise. The Babylonian captivity is a typical experience. It was literal bondage to city life. I think that's what condition we're in today, to base idolatry and to an absolute monarchy. This is the restoration. The restoration meant a return to the country. That's step one. The cultivation by each family of a small portion of land. Notice that step two. Inexpensive homes. That's step three. Simple living. That's step four. Home worship, that's step five. And proper teaching of the children, that is step six. The history of Eden was repeated as nearly as possible under the change conditions. And since the restoration has never been completed, that means right now, today, because men have never been willing to abide by these laws, which alone can make a nation strong, Time will continue until a generation is raised up. Did you hear that? Time will continue until a generation is raised up that by obedience to these laws will make it possible for God to establish a perpetual kingdom on earth. And we know the 144,000 can't come and God set up this perpetual kingdom. And God will not set up this perpetual kingdom except these 144,000 come. So let me read this restoration again. The restoration meant a return to the country, the cultivation by each family of a small portion of land, inexpensive homes, simple living, home worship, and proper teaching of the children. The history of Eden was repeated as nearly as possible under the change conditions. So we're to make our places like Eden again. And since the restoration has never been completed because men have never been willing to abide by these laws, which alone can make a nation strong, time will continue. Continue how long? Until a generation is raised up that, by obedience to these laws, will make it possible for God to establish a perpetual kingdom on earth. 